Welcome to the Dr. Gundry Podcast. Ever heard of a celebrity fashion stylist? How about a lifestyle design expert? Well, my guest today is an expert in both. He's Luke Story, a transformational coach, public speaker, and entrepreneur who has spent the last two decades de developing and refining the ultimate lifestyle. Luke shares his strategies for healing and happiness through his lifestyle design coaching system, YouTube channel, and wildly popular podcast, The Life Stylist. And today he's here to help take your health knowledge and your style to the next level. After a quick break, Luke and I will share what living the ultimate lifestyle could mean for you. Professional fashion advice to help you look and feel your absolute best, no matter your budget, and tips and tricks for optimizing your health and happiness. Okay, Luke, it's great to have you on the Dr. Gundry podcast. Yeah, it's good to see you, man. It's, it's fun to have the mics turned after you coming on my podcast. And uh, I love being interviewed by people that I've interviewed because you already have a bit of rapport under your belt. And it's always a bit more fun and, and loose in that way. Yeah, absolutely. So, okay, what does it mean to be a lifestyle design expert? Help me out. Well, there are certain lifestyles that lead to better physical health, emotional well-being, uh, spiritual connection, things like that. So every choice we make in our lives is going to, of course, be the outcome of our destiny. And so uh, having spent, oh God, about 17 years in, in Hollywood in the entertainment industry as a celebrity stylist, um, all the while I was into personal development, meditation, um, what's now referred to as biohacking, it used to just be called being a health nut. But uh, <laughs> I, start, I started out doing that in the 90s, and so I was doing that for my, myself, and um, I also was, a, well, am a recovering addict, and so I got sober in the 90s and started working with a lot of uh, people in, the, in, in recovery, supporting them and helping them detox and change their diets and, you know, adopt mindset practices and things like that, but it was always something I did in my private life. And after a certain number of years, that started to become so obviously more fulfilling than the career I had. So the lifestyle design is sort of a take on what I used to do where you're taking composite practices or principles or truths that are supportive to your life and, and really building a lifestyle. There's, there's a lifestyle that's, you know, toxic relationships and um, watching horror movies and eating GMOs and, you know, drinking tons of alcohol, smoking cigarettes and having ill health. Um, and then there's a lifestyle where you can actually build practices into your life that support you and, and the relationships that you formed around that. So it's, uh, it's just taking disparate pieces of truth and applying them to one's life for uh, change. So is that what the ultimate uh, lifestyle looks like for you? I mean, is that how you would describe it? Yeah, I would say so because I've, I've built that lifestyle for myself where I do something that I love for a living through my podcast and public speaking and things like that. I'm in a beautifully fulfilling and healthy relationship. Uh, I'm financially sound and secure. I'm 50 years old. I've never had more energy. I've never slept better. I've never felt better in any uh, measurable way, whether it be physically, emotionally, spiritually. And so I'm kind of the test subject of all the things that I try. And then when I find something that I think really has an impact, I share it as widely as I can for those that are interested. Oh, yeah, that's great. And in fact, you know, that's what I did with myself um, when I changed uh, my eating habits, my lifestyle habits. And, you know, I was the, the test bed for this. And then you know, I teach others how to do this. And, you know, I don't even, I don't try a supplement. I don't let, let any, any of my patients have a supplement until I try it on myself. And uh, much of what I've learned about supplements in the early days was a patient would say, hey, you know, what do you know about this? You know, I want to take it. And I go, I don't know anything about it. You know, let me, let me find, look at the research. Let me take it for a month and I'll get back to you and look at my blood work and yeah. Yeah, exactly. So exactly, same same here. So how do you so how do you take that knowledge and help people with with their ultimate lifestyle? Well, I think it starts with the basics, right? So you look at what the problem is with the average person's lifestyle, and then 
you break that into physical practices, movement, relationships, um, diet, things that are just in your day-to-day -day operations on the physical level, the kind of people you're around and things like that. And then the emotional health, you know, is there trauma in your past that's um, causing you to live in negative patterns that are giving you negative outcomes? Uh, then moving into the spiritual realm, do you have some kind of spiritual practice or connection? And looking at what the problem is in any of those one areas, what I've found often is that problems are rooted in us drifting away from the natural human life way, right? Just going back from an evolutionary point of view, we're in tribes of 50 to 60 people with lots of human connection. We're eating foods that are directly from the land, whether they be plants or animals, not lectins, hopefully. <laughs> we're drinking- That was close. We're drinking pure <laughs> spring water, right? Um, we're, we're having ceremonies where there uh, could or could not be uh, entheogenic medicines involved in that of whatever variety or potency. Um, there's going to be dance, there's going to be um, intimate relationships, and we're going to be living at one with the land. And so the further we get away from that, and there's no really any going back to that at this point, and most of us don't want to. I, I love having this call with you on my computer in an air-conditioned house, you know, so... Uh, I have no desire to go live in the woods and become a hermit or try to recreate that. So my lifestyle design is around what's missing that used to be there that's supportive of our well-being and what have we introduced that's deleterious to our well-being and kind of working from there in those categories, whether it be, again, you know, physical as it relates to our body or emotional as it relates to our mindset and overcoming any trauma or any psychological issues that we've um, you know, accumulated throughout our lifetime. And then again, through meditation and mindfulness and various practices of finding and applying spiritual truths to get ourselves spiritually centered and grounded in a way that fits our framework of belief. And in some cases, perhaps even um, expanding our framework of belief if we found it to be limiting. Yeah, that's, that's a good, good way of putting all this. Um, years ago, I used to give a lecture uh, called Ease, E-A-S-E, -E. and those stand for Eating, Attitude, Spirituality, and Exercise. And the absence of those four creates dis-ease. And love so that. disease is, you know, and you, you sum those up very, very well. And I, I came up with that concept in studying uh, super long-lived people and communities. And you've kind of hit on all the correct buttons uh, that really define those, you know, super agers and communities. And it's really fascinating. They all, you know, they share really those four things that, that you've yeah. come up with. And it also, Stephen, it comes from personal experience of going through phases where all I spent my time doing was working on my spiritual evolution and, and raising my consciousness and wasn't paying attention to movement or exercise, right? I thought, well, none of the yogis are ripped and they don't have abs, so why would I want to work out, right? And then, <laughs> and then going through phases trying to, you know, achieve the desired goal, which I think we could all agree is just a fulfilling life of purpose where we have the vitality to do what we want to do. And uh, and then I would try to fix it through biohacking and, you know, the saunas and red light and hyperbaric and ice baths and all those things and get so caught up in the distraction of optimizing the body that some of the spiritual practices would fall by the wayside. So I think that the key is in us finding balance, right, where we have some uh, cognizance of where we might be falling short in any area of our life and, and restoring those things to balance. And And for me, knowing really that Ultimately, the spirit in my own subjective experience, the spiritual connection and practices and adherence to truth as I find truth to be self-evident, having some relationship with a higher power is probably the most important overarching part of the lifestyle and practice, because I've seen so many people, as I'm sure you have, purely through spiritual connection and mindset and emotional health and healing. And then oftentimes the, the physical, more dense world of matter follows suit. I mean, you see this in the Joe Dispenza retreats. Uh, I've been to a number of those and people are having miraculous healings and they're not sitting in there pounding a bunch of supplements or working out, doing resistance training. I mean, they're just having a spiritual connection and the energy of that is enough to actually change their biology. 
So it's it's interesting from that perspective. But I, I think that for especially people that are starting out and they're having issues with um, you know mental illness or physical illness or as you said any kind of disease, it's easier to kind of just start to trim around the edges a bit in all those areas because someone might not be as naturally gravitational towards spiritual practices due to the way they were raised or preconceived ideas. And also, uh, in a similar way, someone might be really adverse to changing their diet dramatically. So, you know, for me, it's like incremental changes, just getting closer to the mark. And eventually over time, you find, wow, I'm really living my life in a different way and I'm seeing the results of that. Okay, so uh, people are obviously gonna wanna know, and people will ask me all the time, Tell me, you, you, you've got life hacks that you swear by. So what does your morning routine look like? Oh, God. Well, you know, it's funny. That goes back to, to the lifestyle. And I, I want to acknowledge that I have set my life up in a way where uh, I'm in charge of my time, right? I mean, I make commitments throughout the day. And there are things, of course, in my career and in my life that I would prefer not to do, the admin work, et cetera. But I don't have a boss, right? I don't have, I don't have a nine-to-five job. So um, if I take too long during my morning routine and I'm a bit too extreme with it, well, then I could pay the price, but I take responsibility for that because I was less productive that day. So I would just want to preface it by saying that I don't think the way I start my day is practical for most people. But again, going back and just taking out what what works for you and what you have time for, I would say if I had to break it down, the single most important thing that I do in the morning is some kind of meditative practice. If I don't take time in silence or sometimes even in a guided meditation, um, you know, I listen to the, again, Joe Dispenza meditation sometimes. Sometimes I do a Vedic meditation where just a mantra and stillness. But if I don't wake up and connect with the part of myself that is not bound by this physical realm and really connect to source, uh, I find that it's much more difficult to be centered, emotionally stable, productive, focused throughout the day. So that would be the number one thing. Uh, another part of my morning practice for many, many years now has been taking a cold shower. I very rarely turn on the water warm or hot ever. I mean, maybe just for fun because it feels good. But cold showers, God, I mean, I've been doing that for 20 years. Taking that a step further, now I'm in a temporary place right now because uh, we just moved here and we are to Austin um, and we're not in our house yet. But I have an ice bath over there and when I'm living where my ice bath is, that's right after the meditation, the ice bath is going to happen. And then uh, on most days I'll do some movement, maybe some resistance training just for 10 or 15 minutes just to kind of get the blood pumping. I like to do that after the ice bath. And then there's, you know, on the physical level, I go through different routines of supplements. I'm thinking when I wake up in the morning right now, before I meditate, I kind of get up and pound a few of my elixirs and then take a sh cold shower and then meditate. But uh, excuse me, I just hit my ring on a really loud metal table. Um, <laughs> <laughs> note to self, don't hit that again. Um, ding, it's a little wake up call. The first thing I do is I go in the kitchen and I'll make a tall glass of spring water and I'll pop a couple uh, molecular hydrogen tablets in there and probably about 20 milligrams of liquid methylene blue. That's kind of my morning drink. And then um, I'll make an herbal coffee elixir. Most of the time for me, that's a decaf organic coffee. I, I don't tend to tolerate caffeine early in the day that well. Later in the day, no problem. Earlier in the day, especially after meditating for an hour, it can be a bit jarring. Uh, and that drink's really good. I put grass-fed butter, uh, MCT oil, Shilajit, tons of collagen, um, tons of, uh, what's the other thing I use, colostrum. So I make just a really nice fatty elixir with as much nutrition as I can get in there, maybe some medicinal mushrooms, um, some cacao, things like that, like a really thick, fatty, filling, high calorie uh, smoothie. And that also makes it easier to go meditate, especially if it's a decaf, because <laughs> I find if I... Ah. If I have caffeine, well then meditation is going to be much busier. The mind's going to be more activated and it's going to be harder to dip back into theta after I've just come out of sleep. So that's kind of, you know, the, the morning drinks, a few supplements, the ice bath, the movement, the meditation. That's usually, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot a huge part of that is breath work too, which I would say I do 
90% of the time, I'll do an, any number of different breathwork techniques, um, something similar to the Wef, Wim Hof method some people might be familiar with, or the type of uh, breath holds they do in Kundalini Yoga, which incidentally is very similar to what the Joe Dispenza meditations recommend, what he teaches. And I find that's just a really good way to prep the mind to dip into that really relaxed state and be able to have access to the non-physical realm, the quantum realm, and to begin to manifest the kind of day that I want to have or work through something that might be percolating in the subconscious that's going to get in the way of my effectiveness that day. So, you know, add that with some, maybe some PEMF therapy, some days a sauna, um, a number of different things I might do depending on how much time, red light therapy, I might stand in front of that on a vibra vibration plate. Some days I might do a hyperbaric chamber. It really just depends on time, but I think the first thing I mentioned are just fundamental meditation, breath work, ice bath, some really you know, uh, high density nutrition right off the bat, and then the day is pretty much set to be um, a success. All right, so uh, I used to joke with Mark Sisson about this. Uh, that's all great, but I have a nine to five job and I have two kids and come on, help, help me out. I know, I know, well that's the thing, we don't have kids yet. We're planning on having kids here and I'm sure I'll be laughing at myself going, oh, remember the days when your morning routine was two hours? But honestly, for someone in that, in that position, I mean, it's a matter of, with some of it, and I think the lowest hanging fruit and probably the most impactful is really the meditation. And People don't have to do an hour or 90 minutes, uh, you know, like I, I prefer to do. Some days it's 20 minutes, but honestly, I think there's so much to be said for a five or 10 minute check-in without looking at your phone, without going onto social media, just wake up, do whatever you have to do to get yourself prepared to sit for a few moments and really check in with yourself. And of course, working with guided meditations and recordings are much easier for people that are newer to that practice. Uh, I think when my meditation really became the most impactful was when I was trained in something called Vedic meditation, which is 20 minutes twice a day. And that's just silence. It's just a mantra based meditation. It's, it's like the sister practice of TM. Many people have heard of transcendental meditation. Yeah. It comes from the same lineage. It's very effective. And if you have someone teach you, it's really not that tough. And what I find is I've had to make sacrifices of other preferences. You know, I might want to get up in the morning and get on my phone and get sucked into that dopamine addiction of thinking I need to know what's going on in the world and you'd be surprised how fast you can burn up 20 minutes you know many people think well I don't have 20 minutes well you might what are you doing with that hour window you have in the morning of course people with kids you know this is probably not possible on on many days but as far as having a job I mean I think most of us are probably spending some time in the morning from the time we get up to the time we leave for work or begin work from home that you could squeeze out a meditation. And if you're going to take a shower anyway, which generally people do in the morning, make it a cold shower. And if you live somewhere like Palm Springs or Phoenix, a cold shower is not gonna be that tough. Of course, if it's midwinter and you're in South Dakota, that's, you know, it takes a little working up to. And for that, I recommend doing contrast showers. That's how I started out. I would do, start out warm or hot, and then I turn it cold and shiver a little bit, and then I go back hot, et cetera, and then end on cold, and then eventually, I just found, God, it's so refreshing just, and actually just mood uplifting to do all cold that I just moved to that. And then of course later to the ice baths. But I would say if you had to pick out one thing that you could find time for that's gonna have the biggest impact on all levels of your health and well being, it's developing a meditation and mindful practice first thing in the morning. Um, now you've moved to Austin and you, you talk a lot about the dangers of EMF and I do too. Um, EMF uh, chased you out of a home, didn't it? Yeah, it did actually. You know, it's one of those pain to purpose stories. And the irony there, Stephen, is that by the time I was damaged by EMF, I was already a huge advocate for EMF safety and protection and was very well aware of, of the implications of especially acute exposure. And so, you know, I have various harmonizing devices in the house, the Soma Vedic, there's a company called Blue Shield out of New Zealand that's great, they make a scalar generator. Uh, I was using grounding sheets, uh, you know, every kind of little sticker you could put on your phone, I mean, all the things, right? With the exception of shielding my bedroom with shielding paint and basically creating a Faraday cage, which is what I just did on our new home. 
So I was well aware of EMFs. I knew that it was dangerous to live in the city uh, for that reason, but it was worth it to me because there were so many opportunities and my life was built in, in Hollywood, in Los Angeles. Um, but what happened there was I moved into an apartment after living in a house in the Hollywood Hills that was very low EMF. It was great. I slept great, felt great. It was wonderful. I moved into this apartment in an area called Miracle Mile in Hollywood. And over the course of the three years living there, I had just major unidentifiable health problems that I could not find the route to. Uh, it manifested as beginning to have to wear glasses suddenly. I lost my distance vision and not like a, you're getting older, but within the course of a couple months, I was finding myself unable to read street signs very rapidly. Um, incredible brain fog. I mean, just debilitating brain fog and confusion and vertigo to the point where there were times I didn't even feel safe driving. And you're talking to a guy that's been biohacking for almost 25 years. I mean, I'm really healthy for my age. That is not part of my experience yeah. generally. Um, and then sleep disturbances. I mean, incredible insomnia, waking up with just crushing headaches on and on and on. So I'm going off, you know, and seeing all the specialists that I know I'm doing, uh, you know, 10 pass IV ozone treatments. I'm doing hyperbaric. I'm doing, you know, really pretty profound interventions, powerful, expensive interventions getting all my labs done all the time. No one can figure out what's wrong with me. Then one day, I just interviewed a guy named Dr. Jack Cruz, and uh, who I interviewed on my show, The Lifestylist, a number of times. And he's very anti you know, EMF and blue light. He's a pretty extreme guy, but he yep. also is knowledgeable. And yep. he's really big on circadian biology. And so I had been watching the sunrises, well, actually way before I met him, but I was doing sun gazing in the morning, which, oh, I forgot. That's another part of my practice is waking up just before sunrise and going out and safely, I want to emphasize that, you don't just go stare at you know, a high UV sun at noon, but I'm talking about right when the sun comes up, I'll usually do my breath work while I'm watching the sunrise. I was doing that and, uh, and just based on Vedic and yogic traditions that I found to be valid and it just helps me feel really good and helps me fall asleep uh, the next night because that's where your dopamine production begins is first thing in the morning, uh, dopamine and then later melatonin. So. I was doing that anyway, and Jack's like, okay, that's great, but you also have to watch the sunset if you really want to nail this circadian biology. So I couldn't see the sunset from my house, so one day I walk into the building next door, which is an office building about three stories high. I'm in a two-story building right next door or across the street. And I make my way up to the roof. I, I say I snuck in there. I mean, it wasn't prohibitive that I go there, but I didn't have any business there. I think to just to try to get to the roof so I could see toward the west and uh, see the sunset. So I get up to the third floor and I see all these huge signs, warning, warning, radiation, danger, danger, Verizon, Verizon. And I just go, oh my God, that's what it what, is. That's what's what it this is. doing here? <laughs> I open the doors and there's two massive multi-mast cell towers pointed right at my apartment, uh, about a hundred yards from my bed where I'm sleeping every night, really close, directly pointing at them. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a blessing and a curse. Out of that, of course, I immediately moved to a, a more secluded place in the Hollywood Hills in Laurel Canyon, and I tested the EMF before I moved in and everything, and then did a lot of uh, interventions at that house once I got there because it was just so debilitating and so destructive to be in that high EMF field. So out of that, I actually created an EMF course. It's still available. It's only $149. It's, I think it's like seven hours of content at this point. You can find it at, I'll just give it a plug because it's very useful for people. It's not going to make me wealthy anytime soon, but it's uh, lukestory.com slash EMF masterclass for those interested. Um, and so that actually led me down the path of really educating people about not only the dangers of EMF, because there's a lot of scare tactics around it. And I think that if your limbic system is fired up and you're living in fight or flight because you're afraid that the cell tower down the street is going to give you cancer, you'll probably get cancer a lot faster than if you just kind of accept that it's there and go on with your life. So it's, it's kind of a, a fine line there between awareness and fear. So I always like to say that, like, don't be afraid of EMF, just get educated and do whatever you can to mitigate it. And I'm going to tell anyone listening from my experience, if you live next door to a cell tower, it's, it's very much worth moving. It's just not, it's not safe. Your Wi-Fi router, your cell phone, I mean, there's some things that are very difficult to get away from because they're such an inherent part of our day-to-day -day life. But if you're experiencing acute exposure, it can be very problematic. Um, so I created a whole course around it and then it became a big part of my platform to really do a lot of research on 
all of the different uh, mitigation techniques from the most simple and inexpensive, just, you know, distance and avoidance to, as I said, shielding many rooms in my new house that I just bought here in Austin, uh, which is, you know, obviously the most effective. But I also elected to not live in the city. I mean, for a number of reasons, I just wanted more peace and quiet and, and just serenity, frankly, after being in L.A. all those years. But <laughs> I moved somewhere where there are very few cell towers around. Your cell phone barely works. It's it's already inherently a very low EMF kind of rural area. It's a neighborhood, but it's pretty rural on Lake Travis. And um, and then I hired a team of people to come in and I, I spent a few thousand dollars to really create a safe haven in the home. And luckily for me, uh, the house was built in 2004, so every room was already wired with ethernet. So in there, we'll have a Wi-Fi router for when we have guests and when we need it, but really they'll just be ports in every room. And if you wanna use a device, you just plug it in like the old days. And so I'm really looking forward to getting in there and having you know, the opportunity to really heal my body from that damage that was done and just the oxidative stress of being a normal human in a modern industrialized world. But this is really at the cornerstone of my teaching when it comes to the physical part of your health because what happened for me in that apartment was that I also started to really suffer emotionally and mentally because of the lack of sleep and the loss of brain function and whatever damage was being done, I was much less happy and much less effective. And I would say my relationships and my career suffered as a result of that. So it's something that I think a lot of us miss. And I know you're, you know, you're an advocate for EMF safety, which is great, but I see so many people that listen to my podcast and follow my work that are spending tons of money on supplements and all these crazy biohacking devices and things. And I'm like, save your money and just EMF shield your bedroom and your kid's room. Like, honestly, that's, I think that is a more powerful intervention than many of the supplements and things we're taking, which are probably just maybe undoing some of the damage caused by a high EMF environment. So it's for me foundational. It's at the cornerstone of, of the lifestyle design that you talked about was I'm taking this freaking ring off. Um, <laughs> dang, there it goes again. Inter <laughs> commercial break. Um, so that is that an, or is that an aura ring by any chance? You know, or? <laughs> my aura ring I only use when I sleep and I put it on airplane actually. Uh, but it is, it is useful to track sleep. Um, I find that to actually be one of the most powerful tools for $300 or whatever it is, because I've gamified sleep for myself so that I want to get better and better at it. And I'll even text my friends when I get a 93 and three hours of deep sleep. The other night I got, I mean, this, I did some high dose um, suppository form of melatonin and I got five and a half hours of deep sleep. <laughs> I was like, yes, my all time, you know, highest score. Uh, so I love the aura ring, but no, that was just a decorative ring. I'm going to keep my wedding ring on just because I never take it off, but it won't bang the table. So that's my take on EMF, Dr. Gundry, is, uh, you know, yeah. safety and awareness over paranoia and, you know, conspiracy. But the fact is many people, especially the propaganda coming out of the telecommunications industry, is that it is a big conspiracy and that it's totally safe and you can just talk all day with your cell phone up to your head. And I'm just going to tell you, if you have a building biologist come to your home or place of work and use... Twenty to thirty thousand dollars worth of very sophisticated equipment that they are competent in using, and you test your environment, and you see all the bells and whistles that go off. It's a pretty compelling, and convincing case for doing some remediation. Yeah, you know, there's a new article uh, just this week about the State Department is just having the worst time recruiting uh, people into their consulates around the world. Uh, because of the experience in, uh, um, you know, ambassador residencies and offices uh, with the State Department being bombarded 24 hours a day with, you know, high dose EMF. Yeah. And uh, yeah, they, they, you know, they, they can't recruit anymore. And, you know, interesting, I, one of my homes is in uh, Santa Barbara, Montecito, and you know, Santa Barbara and Montecito have banned 5G. And, uh, and you're right, it's nearly impossible to get a cell phone signal in where I live. It's, it's actually humorous. Yeah. Um, yeah. Frustratingly humorous, <laughs> but it, 
it's uh, you know it's it's one of those things you go well actually I'm I guess I'm really glad that I, I have a horrible signal but I'm yeah. one of, yeah I'm one of the only people I know if I go somewhere and I have no bars on my phone I'm like yes <laughs> yeah. I'm stoked you know I mean it's like do we you know and that's the thing do we do we really need to be in touch with everyone all the time you know and do we do we need all these smart technologies in our house where you know, we can just sit on our ass and just control everything from an app. It's like, I don't know. I don't I don't know that having that much convenience is really worth the price we pay. It's like, you know, like one of the more difficult things would be, say, a baby monitor. You know, baby monitors are notoriously high in EMF. And when a baby's growing, I think that's got the most important person in your family to shield probably as a baby. Um, and so, yeah, I don't have kids, but I, I'm sure it's very inconvenient to walk in the other room and constantly check on your baby. I mean, it's I'm sure it's a great convenience, but at what cost? You know, that's the thing. And not to shame any parents that use baby monitors, but it is something I like to let people know because a lot of people are unaware uh, of the high amounts of radiation that they put off. But, yeah, I've just kind of retrofitted my life to uh, kind of surrender some of those conveniences in favor of longevity and vitality and um, I'm fine like I have a great career I communicate with people just fine and I also do my best to avoid EMF when it's practical and and sane all right let's talk a little bit since I brought up the aura ring uh, some fun technology and health devices and let me I'm gonna run down the list and in, uh, in the interest of time choose some choose not uh, like red light therapy float tanks the biomat the amp coil and we already talked about the ring. Uh, want to choose any of those, all of them? Or where do you want to go with it? Man, if I, you know, I get asked this question a lot because people that follow my podcast and work in general, they say, okay, I've got a little budget. What's the one thing I could buy? Because some of these things are, you know, they're a few thousand dollars. I mean, the bio, yeah. biocharger is $15,000. A hyperbaric chamber to have in your home, $25,000. I mean, they're not, you could go buy a Prius. You know what I mean? So like... They're right. not for everyone, and I and I understand that. So people often ask, like, what's the one thing? And it's you know, it's really difficult. And what I always actually say is that people, I think, because just kind of our innate laziness as humans, myself included, we want a quick fix. I tell people, save your money, wake up every morning, meditate, pray, do ten minutes of breath work, and take an ice bath. You know, it's like. But people don't, or in, and watch the sunrise, right? But but I honestly believe the things I just mentioned would impact your health more positively than any technology on the market. So I'll just say that the best biohacks are free. Now, if I'm pressed and I had to say like, all right, Luke, we're coming to confiscate, you know, 99% of all this gear you have in your house, because I basically have like a healing center in my house, which I love because I treat my friends and family that don't have access to these things and. It's always free and it's wonderful. I foot the bill and I get the joy of seeing them be restored and, and healed. Um, if I had to pick, I would say a sauna would probably be the thing I just really could not live without. Uh, I've got two of them. I have a clear light infrared sauna and then I have a sauna space which also uses red light therapy at the same time because what heats the sauna space, and it's also a Faraday cage by the way, the sauna space, particular model I have, uh, they use incandescent uh, red light bulbs that are hand blown. So you have very close proximity and deep penetration of that infrared light. It's near infrared in this case. And also you just sweat like crazy and detox and get the benefits of that and the parasympathetic response and all the things you want from a sauna. So I use both depending on if I'm with someone or how much time I have, et cetera. So I think a sauna is probably the one thing I would have to hang on to. Going a bit more high tech, I think the biocharger offers the most uh, kind of wide spectrum of benefits in that it has PEMF, it has uh, frequency applications that do all sorts of different things, whether they be detoxing or supporting different organs or uh, meditation to induce different brainwave states. It's got noble gases in it. It just, it's kind of loaded with a lot of technologies that are historically relevant and well studied, but they kind of packed it all into one device. And it's also something that I like because you can, I don't want to say treat because it's not a medical device, but up to six people can experience a biocharger session at the same time because the energy that radiates from it goes about three to six feet. It diminishes a little bit after three feet, but you can fit six chairs around a biocharger 
and share a biocharger session with a group of people, which also gives you the opportunity to share in community with your family, friends, and loved ones. Whereas, you know, something like a one person sauna or the amp coil or uh, a number of other things like red light therapy, you have to kind of be by yourself and then you're sequestered away and there's no human connection and it, it just kind of takes away time that could be shared with other people. And with the biocharger, you don't have that detriment. It's something that you can actually sit down with some friends and, and share in a healing experience without having to just be by yourself for that period of time. And you can also, you know, sometimes I'll even stack it with other things. I'll listen to uh, my new calm uh, meditation, a neuroacoustic program that I use a lot for like deep mental rest and meditation. And uh, maybe I'll put the biomat or the higher dose infrared mat under me while I'm sitting at the biocharger. So I like to also just stack a number of things together. If I'm going to take 20 minutes out of my busy day, I'm going to do four or five things at once. If possible, I might even breathe some molecular hydrogen out of the hydrogen inhaler while I'm sitting in front of the biocharger or breathe in um, exclusion zone water, or easy water from the nano V while I'm sitting there. So I kind of like to stack them and multiply them. But yeah, sauna would be number one. I would say followed by the biocharger. Or what the heck, you could just come and visit me in Palm Springs in the summer. Yeah, uh, yeah totally. You know, it was 122 yesterday. And oh I, I, can guarantee, I can guarantee you uh, taking a hike, which I did yesterday morning, um, you know, at 115 is a, is a great sauna. <laughs> Absolutely. And that's, a, you know, I'm also a huge advocate, uh, Dr. Gundry, of sun exposure. I think as a culture, we've been brainwashed into thinking that we're supposed to, that safety is indoors. And I believe that pathology is born indoors. If you look at oh, any yeah. healthy culture, and I know you've studied them a lot, as you indicated earlier, these people are living outside all the time. And that's not practical for, for us modern folk, for me either, because I like air conditioning and I like my computer and whatever. Uh, I like to have a nice soft bed to sleep on, but uh, I think sun is so underrated and something that we've really been duped into thinking is going to kill us when it's really the life supporting cosmic energy of our our planet. I mean, it's what makes everything tick. Um, that said, obviously, you don't want to get sunburned and there are ways you can avoid getting sunburn even without putting sunscreen on, you know, astaxanthin, uh, taking a higher dose melatonin at night, like those suppositories I mentioned. I mean, there are things that can almost render you unburnable. And chaga tea, for example, a really strong chaga tea, it's got uh, tea, it's got melanin in it. I mean, there's different things you can take internally to build that solar callus faster, even if you're fair skinned. And I've experimented with this on you know, freckly redheaded people that get burned in five minutes and I run them through my sun protocol incrementally, they get more exposure, you know, each time so that they don't burn and they just get tan and, and they're able to, you know, get the benefits of, you know, some sun exposure. So that's, um, that's also something in the free category, right? That I think many people miss, or maybe they don't want to have the discipline to build up that solar callus and be able to tolerate more sun exposure. So they, hide inside and then they go on vacation and they're out on a boat and they slather on a bunch of skin cancer causing sunscreen, you know, but I believe in the full spectrum light of the sun in our eyes, again, not looking at the bright sun, but just sunlight in the eye um, and that, you know, full spectrum of, of light, visible and non-visible and also the photoreceptors on our skin were basically a walking solar panel. And yep. I mean, I, I could never live anywhere where it's not sunny a lot, honestly, because I'm just... I literally am a sun worshiper, so I would, I'd also kind of throw that in there somewhere. And it could, in fact, replace a sauna in some ways if you live somewhere, like you said, that's really hot. And especially if you're getting the, the, the um, dawn and dusk sun gazing in and that red light exposure where there's virtually no UV to burn your skin, but you still get the benefits of that red light. Yeah, I've written, uh, uh, in The Energy Paradox, I talk a lot about uh, sun sp exposure and building a sun callus and the benefits of you know sun exposure. Yeah, I, I haven't worn sunscreen in the last twenty years, and I, I've never I, seen it my whole life. I eat my sunscreen, and people exactly. go, "What do you mean?" And I, I said, "No, I'm not eating sunscreen. Uh, yeah. You know, I don't I don't squeeze copper tone down my throat." Uh, but you're right. You you can absolutely uh, protect yourself from sun. Um, so. I, I want to switch gears. Uh, it's clear you really help, want to help love, help others live their life to the fullest. And in the past, you were teaching people how to dress their best. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
so what's what's it like being a celebrity fashion stylist? You know, I think that career was just so, I mean, it went on for so many years, but it's something I just fell into. I had no plan to do that, but I was a musician living in Hollywood. Uh, I had a difficult time earning a living doing that, as many artists do, uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, now I think I, I just don't think I was a highly exceptional musician that might have had something to do with it. I was okay, but I wasn't great, you know? Um, so I was working doing that and I had uh, just gone off to a treatment center when I was 26 years old. I had gotten sober and, and still am. And it was, you know, the, the biggest miracle of my life truly. But after that, I really didn't know what to do with myself because I wanted to do something uh, that was legal and that wasn't going to put me in a compromised position of relapse, frankly. And so I had a friend that was a fashion stylist uh, who had done so for many years and she kind of had pity and compassion on and for me and um, she hired me as her assistant and right after she did so, uh, she booked Aerosmith as a client. And <laughs> so, you know, here I am, this kid in my 20s, I'm newly sober, my life is just in a shambles, I'm just a complete train wreck in every way, but, but there's hope because I'm getting a little better day by day. I'm, adhering to the you know the principles of recovery and I'm taking care of myself and starting to detox and learn about health and things like that um, but I really didn't know what to do with my career so she hires me and I'm just thrown from that into the fire and this is when this particular band was huge they had a real resurgence in the late 90s and one of the things that I think was fateful about that particular gig was that they were really the world's first publicly sober band and they attributed much of their, you know, newfound success and reemergence into pop culture uh, due to the fact that they'd all cleaned up their act. And so here I am hired by like one of my childhood hero bands and they're cool and they don't wreck their lives with drugs and alcohol. And so it was really inspiring to me and supportive. And through that, I, I entered into that industry and found that it was great because I could still play music myself and pursue that career at night. And then during the day, I essentially dressed other musicians and, uh, and you know, actors and models and things like that. So what the career really consists of when you're a fashion stylist or it's called a wardrobe stylist is you're the person that goes and collects the clothes and puts together looks for whoever's going to be on camera or on stage. So if I was your stylist, Dr. Gundry, and you had this recording today, you tell me, what your, your style preferences are, and then I would figure out what, what colors and what fit might be good for you, and what's an archetypal style that would be good for a doctor who does media. I might say, hey, let's get some like purple frame glasses, you know, just to give you a little, a little extra, you know, a little uh, non-traditionality, let's say. Uh, so you just spend your time essentially driving around, you know, wherever you live, in my case it was Hollywood, driving around in traffic all day long, picking out clothes, taking it to the photo shoot or the fitting or the red carpet event, dressing that person and then taking it all back. So I used to joke and say, you know, people say, what's your job like? And I said, basically, I'm a mover, but I only <laughs> move clothes and jewelry and accessories. So that's kind of the, you know, the nuts and bolts of it. But it was a job that was creative in the sense that you're creating art on a person. And so much like a musician, writer, painter, you're taking a blank canvas and you're creating something out of that. You're taking a person standing there in their underwear and you're creating an image of them and for them. And so that part of it I really enjoyed and found expression in that to the point I eventually stopped trying to pursue music and I went full into that. Um, but it was also a really stressful job because you're working within the corporate machine of the fashion industry and the entertainment industry and dealing with publicists and managers and difficult personalities and egos like you can't imagine. So there's a lot of stress and really long hours. And eventually after, I mean, 17 years of that, I decided to move on and start my podcast and really just completely exit that industry and go into health and wellness. But along the way, I did learn a lot about psychology and that people do tend to feel better when they look better. And I don't think you can fix yourself and your emotional problems and wounds and insecurities solely from the outside in. It really is an inside job. But there is something to be said for looking your best and feeling fit and going out into the world with a higher degree of confidence. It's like you can imagine you sitting there, Dr. Gundry, in, in your chair doing this video. If you were wearing some dirty old sweats and a ripped T-shirt with a ketchup stain on it, 
you would probably feel different about yourself emotionally and you would project a different kind of energy on the world versus you being very neatly tailored and dressed in a really cool suit and those great glasses. It's just there's something about it that does have a psychological impact that that is positive. But I think for me it was just a turn off in the sense that when you become too reliant on something external and your whole ego identity and personality is based on how others perceive you and your self-worth and self-value is based on what you're projecting, which is more a case for dressing for other people to get their approval and to get attention and to feed the ego versus like, wow, I really found a look that works for me and my personality and is sort of a signal to the people I interact with in the world as to what I'm all about. So I have my little kind of faded Western denim shirt on now. If you saw me, you'd be like, oh, that guy's a little bit earthy or whatever your assumption would be. It kind of identifies you as a tribe. If you have your suit on and you're a doctor and you want to be respected and taken seriously, when I look at you, I'm not, I'm, I don't think, oh, this guy's probably just a, a hippie that doesn't know what he's talking about or, you know, or whatever, right? Um, all right. He's a couch potato from the Midwest that just eats chips and drinks beer all day or one watches football. Like, I don't see that. I look at you and I go, wow, this guy kind of demands respect. So there, there is a message that we send to uh, the world that we project based on how we look, and it is a way to sort of identify your tribe, right? You meet like-minded people, you might be at a conference, and you meet other professionals like you, and you kind of have a code of ethics that you assume to live by based on the costume that you're presenting. And when you get pulled over by a cop, imagine if he had his gym clothes on, you probably wouldn't take that cop as seriously as that that, you know, uh, uniform. Ironed, yeah. ironed and starched uniform with a big badge and a gun on, right? So I think there is something interesting psychologically about it, but at the same time, there is a, a dividing line between how much of that is an ego projection of who you want to be or how you want people to see you and how you just really feel good in your body. And so I encourage people in terms of their choice of dress to, to just be wildly you, uh, come what may, and to find things that are appropriate for your lifestyle, your occupation, um, your, your dating habits, whether or not you're married or not, things like that. I mean, there's so many practical aspect of one's life that's going to indicate how they dress or not. You might have someone who's married and the way they dress might be less appropriate for a married person and more appropriate for someone who's single and out on the dating scene, for example. So um, I think it's interesting from that perspective. That said, I don't pay much attention to it. I just kind of found my style that fits me. And when I, you know, look in the mirror before I walk out the door, I go, cool. Like the inside matches the outside. But I also have no problem going out looking like a total dork because my sense of self-worth is not dependent on the clothes I'm wearing. And sometimes I enjoy wearing really nice clothes, expensive clothes at times. And sometimes I really don't care. I went to a dinner party last night. I was wearing shorts and a T-shirt. And there are other people dressed much nicer than me, but that's what I felt like wearing last night because I wanted to be comfortable and relaxed, you know? So I think there's kind of some bandwidth there we can play with. So what do you think uh, the COVID impact of everybody for the last year and a half and looks like more uh, sitting around in sweats and pajamas, um, is that, and working from home, it, it, do you think that's having an impact on our own self-esteem, our own self-worth? You know, that's really interesting. And that goes back to, you know, the outside influencing the inside. And, and there have been some studies with, with clothing and also with body language that indicate that you do produce different neurotransmitters, uh, different brain waves, things like that, based on um, what you're wearing and also how you position yourself in your body language. There was one uh, special I saw, for example, where they sent people on these kind of double blind, or I guess it was a single blind job interview, where only the interviewee knew that that was happening, the interviewer did not, and they had people before they walked into the interview do what we call in yoga like lion's pose, like ah, and just get really big, you know, just physically just big and threatening and then relax and walk in the room. And those people were hired at a much greater um, to, uh, rate than the people that went in just kind of slunched over. And so that's an example of like the external influence in the inside. And I think the same, I'm sure there have been studies uh, on this too, but I'm sure it can be also said for how you feel and what you're wearing and your degree of confidence and effectiveness. And I believe that for myself, there are times when I wanna sit at my computer and I know I need to do some deep work 
and whether or not anyone's going to see me, sometimes I actually just get dressed, even though I don't have to. I mean, I could sit there and work in my underwear. No one's around except the wife, you know? So it's not necessary, but I just think, God, I kind of feel like a slob. And so perhaps I'm going to work like more of a slob. And so I think to your point, there, there probably is some validity to that. And I think it probably has impacted people's confidence and productivity to some degree. I don't know how that can be measured, but I know subjectively in my own life, if I look good, I generally feel good. And therefore my work is going to reflect that. Yeah, I think that's a good piece of advice. Speaking of advice, because we got to wrap things up, but how people on a budget and how do they get the most out of fashion if they if they've got a limited budget? Any tricks? Yeah, I think when it comes to saving money when you're buying <coughs> clothes, something to think about is putting your money where it matters. And you do that by spending the money on staple pieces that are going to have longevity. A lot of people that shop for clothing and end up wasting money are people that buy things that are trendy and are going to have a much shorter shelf life. So for example, everyone, oh not everyone, but let's just say uh, your average man needs a great blazer. You gotta have one good blazer. I mean, even if you're not a suit guy, eventually you're gonna go somewhere and you're gonna have to wear a blazer, okay? Maybe, maybe a tie or two. Uh, so that would be something that I would invest in. For some guys, maybe you need just one good leather jacket, you know, for a, a night out on the town when it's a little more casual. That's something I would spend money on. I wouldn't spend money on the blazer that's got rhinestones all over it, and I wouldn't spend the money on the leather jacket that's got 40 different colors and embroidery all over it. I would get something that's classical, more timeless, right? For, um, for a female, this would be maybe a really great black cocktail dress right? That's, that's not really in a trend. It doesn't have anything ostentatious about it. It's a great fit. It's something that you're going to get a great cost per wear out of. So cost per wear is a principle of, if I spend 500 bucks on this thing, how many times am I actually going to wear it? Say a really great fitting pair of jeans. You could go get, you know, some trendy jeans that might be out of style in a year for 60 bucks, or you could go get some 250, $300 jeans that are, are not that loud or trendy or you know interesting but they just fit you really well and they're durable they're very well made and you're going to get a higher cost per wear out of that item so for things that are more trendy and fun and just catch your eye and are a bit more flashy i always recommend buying those on the cheap and then spending your budget on things that you're actually going to get some longevity out of i mean as we speak i have blazers for example in my closet and i'm not even exaggerating i've had them for 10 years and I still wear them. They still fit. They're still in style. They're most of them are Dior. Uh, when a few years, ten years ago, Dior had a great designer working for them in the men's division, and uh, they're just beautiful. They're just you know they're made in Italy. They're just outstanding, and there's no reason to get rid of them because they never go out of style. Now, now if you're someone who's on camera a lot, uh, like you know influencers, public personalities, etc., it gets to be a bit more complex because you don't want to be photographed in the same thing all the time. That's when you have a stylist. That's where a stylist comes in because they get you fresh, you know, they refresh your wardrobe all the time so that your Instagram isn't you wearing that same day. Good yeah, point. That's what I do. Spend your money on the staple pieces that are going to have some longevity. Yeah, and in fact, uh, I, I've found through the years that uh, Armani suits fit me literally without any tailoring and they'll last forever and Quite frankly, most of my life I have been unable to afford Armani suits, except uh, I go to Italy quite a bit and there's an outlet for Armani south of Florence called the Mall and you can get a Armani suit which might cost $4,000 and up for 500 bucks. And wow. so, so yeah, and so it's funny, most of my Armani suits come from the mall in Florence. And if anybody's watching, please don't go there because you'll buy it out and <laughs> yeah. I won't have any the next time I'm there. Edit that but yeah. Out. yeah, and you know, you're right. I have Armani suits that, you know, when I lost weight over 20 years ago, I actually still have a couple of those suits and I still wear them. They've just been so reliable and the, the style really hasn't changed, you know. Yeah. And, yeah. and it's, it's classic. That brings, so. me, that brings me, I can give you one more tip on that and something that I have adopted over the past three years or so, and that is actually buying 
uh, pre-owned clothing. So there's a website called therealreal.com. Yes, yeah. And I mean, you go on there and buy things and they're 50 to 75% off and they don't, they don't like, cause I've, I sell my clothing to them too, which is cool. So I might buy something, say like, that's a little more trendy. I know I might not wear it that much. So I might spend a little money on it, but then I'll turn around in a year and sell it back to the real real. I mean, you take a little loss, of course, but I find that is a really great website and just a great way to do it. Even designer re resale shops, which don't typically have a lot of menswear, but for women, those can be great. You can go get a, you know, a Gucci dress that was $3,500 and now it's 900, which I know is still a lot for some people. But if you want designer clothing, that's a really great way to do it. And it's also more environmentally sound, right? Because you're just... You know, it's another form of recycling and so much of the pollution and waste on the planet is what we call fast fashion. It's just cheaply made clothing that's, you know, full of dyes and God knows what starches, flame retardants, who knows what. Most of it's made out of plastic also, which ends up, you know, microplastics everywhere, the whole thing. So environmentally and budget wise, I really like the idea of buying pre-owned clothes and then also selling your clothes rather than you know, throwing them away or at least if not, if they're not sellable to at least donate them so that someone who's uh, of lesser fortune can then use those clothes, which might be really nice to them, even though they're not to you anymore. Yeah, yeah I'm glad you brought up uh, that that site. My daughter, I, I love ties. I've got so many ties, I can't stand it. But she uh, she always buys me ties from Real Real. Yeah, um, yeah, that's yeah. Great. and you know they're great ties, and they're they've barely been used. In fact, you really can't tell they have been. Yeah, and totally. so it's it's a great way to get a great tie for you know a very reasonable price. Yeah. All right, I got to let you go. It's been All great right. having you on the program. Where do my listeners find out more about you and your work? Yeah, thanks for having me on, man. And uh, thanks for coming on my podcast. And that's, I think... Yeah, thanks, thanks for having me. Yeah, the flagship of what I do is the Life Stylist Podcast, uh, where I interview uh, metaphysics experts like Bruce Lipton, Joe Dispenza, uh, doctors like you, biohackers like Dave Asprey, psychologists, shamans, spiritual teachers, meditation teachers... That's been going for six years, and we're at seven million downloads. It's a pretty popular show, and uh, it's kind of the lifeblood of what I do. And out of that, I do speaking engagements and uh, workshops and the online course, the EMF Masterclass. Uh, again, that's lukestory.com slash EMF Masterclass. And then on social media, I'm at Luke Story on Instagram. That's the, my main platform there. I'm, I'm live streaming this one at the moment. And then where you can find all of that in one place for ease of uh, search is lukestory.com. That's story with an E-Y. Perfect. All right. Well, good luck with everything. And again, thanks for, thanks for being here. And good luck with the new house. And uh, may you remain shielded, my friend. Yes. Thank you so much. <laughs> I certainly will. All right. Take care. Take care. All right, it's time for our audience question. This week's question comes from Lynn Youngblood on YouTube, who says, vegetable capsules. How do we find out if the vitamins we are taking have corn in the capsule? I looked it up, and uh, lots of them are made from hydromellose, which is from trees. So quite frankly, I have a number of patients who become hypervigilant about seeking out corn and things that are made from corn. But the point that I want to emphasize over and over and over again is that most of the sensitivity that we see in people to corn comes from the proteins in corn. And I'll use a, a great example. Allulose, which is now my favorite new natural sweetener, which has no calories, almost all of it is made from corn. But it isn't corn and it doesn't have any corn proteins in it and get the GMO varieties please but you don't have to search labels carefully for you know little tiny bits of corn that's not the problem it's the big problem is quite frankly if you're sensitive to corn don't eat an ear of corn uh, don't have a corn tortilla that's where I see the vast majority of my patients get into trouble. It's these normal doses of corn that gets them into trouble. It's not the minute stuff. Uh, so keep that in mind. Okay, uh, review of the week. 
This week's review comes from Reb O on iTunes who says, I've been an avid follower of Dr. G ever since I read The Plant Paradox shortly after it was published and cured myself of a lesser, no <coughs> excuse me, of a lesser known autoimmune condition, chronic urticaria, that I had since I was a teen. I had seen numerous traditional doctors, experts, who assured me that the cause was unknown, there was nothing I could do, it wasn't about food, and would just smile and take the pills. Well, since following the plant paradox lifestyle, I have been med-free for about four years and truthfully forget I ever had an autoimmune condition. I continue to layer on additional recommendations from Dr. G for longevity. I had a baby at 46, good for you, Rebo, and continue to feel better and better, younger and full of life and energy. The diet changes are big, but so worth it. Hey, if I can give up peanut butter, anybody can. Well, Rebo, your story is, is classic for the people who come to see me, who have been told there is no cure treatment for their autoimmune disease by uh, numerous physicians. And thank you, you've never seen me. All you did was read the book. And that's the feedback that keeps me writing because you have the ability to take back your health and it does take some work and it takes throwing away your peanut butter among other things and it probably means throwing away your corn and corn tortillas but it's worth it just like you're finding out and thanks so much for writing in and again those of you who are watching or listening please 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 write us a review on itunes uh, if you got a question or just want a story because it's stories like this that keep me doing what I do because I'm Dr. Gundry. I'm always looking out for you. We'll see you next week. Before you go, I just wanted to remind you that you can find the show on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts because I'm Dr. Gundry and I'm always looking out for you. Mm -hmm.